All right. The next one we'll talk about, we have two more um, relationships left, one of which we've kind of talked about already, is competition. So competition, you are familiar with this word because we use it in the, the human language uh, quite often. And what competition is when looking at it in a biological sense is when species compete for a similar resource. Depends on what the species is. If it's plants, um, they might be competing for sunlight. Uh, if it's animals, they might be competing for space or for food. Uh, for bacteria or fungi, it could be for food. So it's species competing for something. And typically, um, this relationship is expressed as a negative-negative relationship, where species A has to spend more time finding food. Species B has to... Uh, get food all times of the day versus a narrow window of the day. Typically, the species that are involved have to exert more resources in order to get the resource they need. So for example, if organisms were fighting over food, they might have to, one, literally fight each other for food, that uses energy. They might have to look for food longer, that's going to use energy. Uh, they might have to go further out to look for food, which is going to use energy. So typically, that's why we consider this a negative-negative relationship, is if you're competing for something, you're typically making sacrifices in order to get that resource that you need. Now, competitions typically end up one of two ways. There's kind of two directions that competition can go in uh, over a period of time. One thing that can happen with competition is something referred to as the competitive exclusion principle. And essentially what this is saying is that if there's two organisms kind of battling for the same resource, at the end of the day, one is somehow going to be better adapted than another one. It could be because one species is faster. One species can smell that food faster. That plant uh, has larger leaves and can get more sunlight. One species has an advantage over the other one and ends up out competing the other one. It gets more sunlight. It gets more food. It gets more space. The other species doesn't get that resource and ends up dying out. So the graphs that I've showed here are kind of a, a, a simple experiment that was done where um, two, I think it was protists, it could be a bacteria. We're going to say protists, but just know it could be a bacteria. That when these protists were grown by themselves, here's their population growth. So here's over, say, 15 days. Here's the number of cells of this protist. So going from zero to about 250 in 15 days by itself. Here is another species, same time period, about 15 days, and after about 15 days, there's about 60 of these organisms. So they grow just fine by themselves. The other species grows just fine by themselves. But when you put them together, when those two species are together, this green species doing great. Its population is growing, it's getting enough food, whereas this purple species isn't, and eventually it ends up dying uh, because it wasn't able to get enough food or space or sunlight or whatever resource was lacking uh, in this experiment, probably food. And so this is just showing that, hey, when you have two species competing for a similar resource, one thing that might happen is competitive exclusion, where at the end of the day, there will be one winner. Uh, both don't coexist. So this is one thing that can happen. And they kind of show this a little bit further. Um, I want to talk about this idea of a niche. So I said earlier when they're competing for a similar resource, and what that likely means is that those two species probably had similar niches. Uh, so a niche, sorry, this popped up all weird. This niche is a functional role in the ecosystem. What is the essence of this organism? Thinking about zebra. Zebra migrate, they're big, they're herbivores, they eat grass, they're active during the day. So when I say functional role, it's really what is that organism? What natural history or life history traits does it have? How long is its lifespan? How long before it reproduces? When they have young, how quickly do the young move? Now, when we're talking about competition, typically the part of the niche that we care about the most is where does it live 
how does it eat, and how does it use its other resources. Because when it comes to competition, that's typically where the competition originates from. It's organisms that have similar habitats, that have similar food requirements, that have similar needs for different resources, and that's where the competition happens. So again, when organisms have similar niches, that's when we start seeing competition. Now here we have two species of barnacles, this thamelis, which are the small brown ones, and these balanus, which are the larger blue ones. And I'm going to use this example that's here on the right hand side to kind of explain these two concepts of a fundamental niche and a realized niche. When we're talking about fundamental and realized niches, we're typically talking about habitat. So remember, niche can involve a whole bunch of things, uh, but typically what we're referring to when using these two terms is the habitat part of a niche. So a fundamental niche was kind of going to be similar to our previous slide. So when we grew our two protists by themselves, this is how large they got, this is what they ate, this is what they did. And when we talk about a fundamental niche in the context of these barnacles, it's where can they be found? So there's no competition around. If they had the whole world to themselves, where would they be found? So here in this diagram, the balanus ones are actually in their fundamental niche. We see that here. So its fundamental niche is running from the water line to about halfway up this rock face. If there was no thamelis around. If there was no balanus around, this thamelis could actually grow all the way from this high tide line all the way down to this low tide line. So they actually can grow in the entire cliff face. So the fundamental niche is where a species is actually found if there is no competition with other species. And in some areas, that, that's it, right? Thamelis is the only barnacle there, they live everywhere. If balanus is the only one there, they live everywhere. But we're talking about competition. So the realized niche is when there is competition, where is that species actually found? If competitive exclusion is happening, if one species is outcompeting the other, where are we really finding these species? So let's go back to this example. The actual drawings of the barnacles on this picture are the realized niches. This is in the presence of competition. So the balanus barnacles, these large barnacles, are found actually in the same as their fundamental niche. Everywhere the balanus can be found in real, in real life is where it's actually found. But take a look at the brown ones, the thamelis. Sure, thamelis can be found on the entire rock face, but they're not. In the presence of competition, in the presence of balanus, their realized niche, where they really are in nature, is just in the areas where balanus can't inhabit anyway. It's actually cool biologically, you notice in this picture the balanus are nearly double the size of thamelis. What happens is when thamelis tries to move down this rock face, because again they can live everywhere on that rock face, the balanus actually start growing underneath them and pop them off. Uh, the balanus are just larger, right? They're better competitors for this space. That's the resource they're fighting for. Balanus doesn't want to keep growing higher. It could be because they need to be exposed to water more often than the, just the high tide line. So thamelis can exist there. So we use these terms, again, usually when talking about habitat. Our realized niche is the result of competition. So both these organisms are cohabitating. Uh, but there have been concessions, right? Thamelis is not in its entire range. A uh, thamelis is only in part of its range. And so this is kind of competitive exclusion, right? Down here, where the thamelis could have lived, this is competitive exclusion, right? We had two organisms. They both wanted that rock face. One outcompeted the other. This thamelis is still living here though, um, maybe not everywhere it wants to be, but it's at least still living there. And this is going to kind of segue to the other thing that can happen when it comes to competition. Remember, one thing that can happen when it comes to competition is you have two species, one outcompetes the other. The other thing that can happen is niche partitioning. So partitioning as a word just means kind of like setting up spaces or barriers. 
So niche partitioning is saying things like, sure, we both live in this area, but I'm going to eat this and this organism eats this. Or they eat during the day and this one eats at night. Or this one travels five miles, this one travels two miles. So they're using a similar resource, but they might be using it in a different way. So the African Serengeti is a great example of this. In this picture, we see wildebeest, we see zebras, we see elephants, and all of these organisms are large herbivores. They need a lot of vegetation to sustain their populations. So their niches overlap a little bit, right? Being large herbivores literally in the same habitat. But they partition it. They do things differently. For example, elephants. Uh, elephants are typically eating things from trees. They can reach it. It's easier for them to do it. And trees are typically going to have a lot more vegetative material than, say, grasses. Wildebeest and zebras both eat grasses, but uh, the zebras are eating kind of the top of the grasses. They're a lot softer. Wildebeest, which have essentially calloused lips, uh, can actually dig down and even take some of the roots of grasses, things that zebras can't reach. So in this case, all of these organisms are cohabitating with one another. They are competing with one another. They want a similar resource. They live in a similar area, but they use it differently. And these small little differences in how they use a similar resource is what enables all of them to coexist. This video that I'm going to have you guys watch, the classic example of niche partitioning is looking at warblers, which are a type of bird. And the example that the video will talk about is how there's this one tree that supports five different warbler species. And it talks about how these warblers are part partitioning that tree. Now, I don't want you to think, and you probably don't, but I don't want you to think that these organisms are talking to one another, that they're like, hey guys, why don't you eat just the grasses and we'll eat the trees? Like this is, this is not how that works. We can use natural selection to explain this. Zebras that ate, uh, or there was variation in what zebras ate. Some of them ate softer grasses, some of them ate harder grasses, some of them maybe pulled from trees. But those that could eat the, just the finer grasses were probably getting more food because another organism was eating the trees, maybe better. So elephants, for example, they can strip a tree a lot faster than zebras can. Uh, the wildebeest can get down to the roots maybe a lot more efficiently than zebras could. And zebras were able to specialize, aka the ones that could eat the tops of grasses, got more food, they reproduced more, they passed on that preference to their offspring, and those that were trying to still eat trees maybe couldn't find enough food because elephants were just doing it a lot more efficiently. And so niche partitioning is just the result of evolution, but it's really cool to see how organisms can coexist on these same resources. So before moving on, go ahead and watch um, this video. I'm going to warn you now, I think it was like college or high school students who made this video, um, but they talk about these warbler species and in general talk about competitive exclusion and niche partitioning. So go ahead and pause here, watch this video that is popping up above me, and then come on back. All right, one more interaction left, and this is looking at predation and herbivory. So with predation and herbivory, both of these words are referring to the same thing, where one organism is benefiting, so this would be the predator, or this would be the herbivore, and the other organism isn't. Uh, it's not benefiting, it's not neutral, it's, it's dying, right? So it's a negative interaction. These two different words are referring to what's being consumed. So when you're talking about predation, we're talking about an animal eating another animal. When we're talking about herbivory, it's an animal eating a plant. Um, so you probably knew that, but we kind of group these together because it's kind of the same thing. So here in this picture, we have a shark eating a seal. So definitely predator, predator prey relationship. Uh, on a on a nicer note, uh, here's a sea turtle eating sea grasses. We don't really refer to the sea turtle as a predator. Like, grass is not prey because grass is not really defending itself, or at least it's not defending itself in the typical ways a prey item might defend itself. And then sometimes, and that's what this video is going to show you, that predators prey on other predators, and it's pretty badass and 
terrifying at the same time. Um, I'm not really going to talk much more about this in this video. Another video that's coming up is going to talk more about these predator-prey interactions and how prey try to avoid being prey and how predators try to be better predators. So this is the end of this lecture video. Um, before kind of closing out of this, just watch this last video that is popping up here. It's a really cool clip about predator going after predator. Uh, so pause here, end this video, and go watch this video before moving on.